you, uh, Tom Popkowitz, who is professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison in curriculum and instruction. Is that right? And I just make a short introduction, and then he's going to talk. So, Tom's studies they are concerned with the, for you who haven't read them, with this uh, notion of system of reasons that govern education policy and research, and uh, from a Foucauldian tradition. He has developed theories of understanding how certain cultural thesis comes to be counted as knowledge or reason in educational context, and how these systems of reason fabricate a very specific kind of desirable child which is governed and controlled for this. So school subjects and curricula are here seen as cultural thesis, defining certain ways of being and living as the right or the wrong, and in that way, differentiate children through definitions of normality and otherness. And I first met Tom through his fantastic book, Cosmopolitanism and the Age of School Reform, Science Education in Making Society by Making the Child, which I recommend. It's also in Swedish. <coughs> so in this book, he in a very beautiful and mind-teasing way explores the uh, narratives of enlightenment and cosmopolitanism that operate as a double gesture of inclusion and exclusion in school. It's a good intention to educate all children, no one left behind, into reasonable, empowered citizens of the future simultaneously fabricate the ab abject other, the child left behind, as the dangerous population, part of dangerous population. So this is what Tom is challenging. And um, he is a frequent flyer to Sweden. I think he knows more educational researchers than me in Sweden, I guess, and also the Swedish education reforms. And he's now working with the impracticality of the politics of educational research that seeks practical and useful knowledge in school reforms. And I think he will discuss this from some Swedish recent example. Isn't that right, Tom? So, with that said, I will warmly welcome you to talk about the impracticality of practical knowledge, research on teacher and, and teacher education. And after that, we will have some time for questions and reflections. So, well, what is your Thank you. Um, it's very nice being here. It's, it's the second time I'm here, the first time. I was in Malmo, I don't know how many years ago, we were doing for, I forgot who it was, it was Affair, the, the Science Foundation and Evaluation of Swedish Research. So it's nice, in that time, Malmo was part of Lund, so it's nice to be back and it's a very nice city. Um, we were talking the other day about how people start research, and I have to say this project that I'm working <coughs> on, I sort of fell into in a number of ways. One, I realized that I've written a lot about planning, but basically historically about why the idea of planning was never planned. If you look historically at the social sciences, which is where I start, a lot of what happens about the idea of how you plan society and you plan people, because they're really the same, and historically at least wasn't planned, it sort of happened. Um, and part of that made me go back historically to things like the Enlightenment, um, to think about it. Because at least in the American context, you never think about the Enlightenment, you just think of the American Revolution. And you sort of follow that trajectory. And then when you read more, you realize actually there was something called the American Enlightenment. And there were people, if you know a little of American history, like. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and a whole bunch of other people who were very much Enlightenment figures influenced by European thought. Um, and then you realize also that almost all of the early social scientists, including John Dewey, who's sort of the folk hero, spent a lot of time in Europe, particularly Germany, um, and influenced by German Enlightenment, but they brought it back to the U.S. in a different way. Um, and so I sort of backed into this and then in the last few months, and I'll talk more about it, uh, actually the past six to eight months, I started doing research on research in education, particularly as it relates to 
teacher education, and there's a very big movement in the U.S., and I don't think it's only in the U.S., but it's about teachers' practices. And so what I started to do is look at and treat my research object as research. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, to think about research not as telling us, but how is it possible that people say these things they say and do the things they do. And in that, um, I also, I was playing with this, so that means I don't know what's going to come up. Um, got involved in a project with the Swedish Science uh, Foundation with Circuit Lindblad and Daniel Pedersen, um, looking at <coughs> reviews of research related to PISA. And so I'm going to try to talk about both of these together. I don't know if it will work, but in my mind, they belong together. One dealing with everyday life of teachers, and the other says it's dealing with nations, but really dealing with the everyday life of teachers. And I'll try to show how. So this is what I'm going to do. These are sort of I'm going to walk through. And I'm going to sort of focus on what I want to say about them, and then also say that it's each of these sentences are built upon 30, 40 pages of analysis of stuff that I did. Not to say it's accurate or true, but to say I'm making summaries of them. Um, and so I'm going to make claims about them versus sort of doing a statistical analysis of them. Um, first, I'm going to talk about PISA, and I'm going to talk about the practices of core practices or practices of teachers that are being studied as salvation themes. That is, there are ways of thinking about how you save the nation but save people. And then I'm going to then move to say that in saving people, you have to make those people and talk about the research as not about describing what's happening, but trying to develop a way of thinking about what your desired <coughs> society and people are like, and then to go out and get data to try to actualize that desired teacher. And I, it's sort of, I don't have a better word for it, it's like a, a closet utopianism. At the turn of the 20th century, people actually wrote about utopianism. Um, now they don't write about it, they just assume it the way they do research. Um, and then I'm going to look at practices of theory. Um, that conserves versus and change, but it's ironic in conserving, it's also trying to produce a particular way of thinking about who people are, and not only teachers. I mean, that's the other thing. Those of you who work in studies of teachers or teacher education, it's not about teachers only. It's about what I call the trilogy. The idea of remaking the teacher is to remake the child and remake the family, and in that, to remake society. And when I say that, these are not normative comments. These are very um, analytical comments. When I look at the literature, you very clearly see that that's what they're talking about. When they say they want the teacher to have these behaviors, to do these things, they're usually talking about it because they want them to do that to change the child. And it's, if you read the text, it's in there. They talk about the child, and they talk about the family, <coughs> including Pisa, by the way. Um, and then I'll. Um, talk about another irony is that in this idea to make an inclusive society is a comparative way of thinking that excludes. And in that, then, if you take that as a way in which these reforms and these research practices are going on, you have to say, at the end, maybe we should think about it differently. Um, so let me now um, go on. All right. Google Image is very nice. By the way, when you go to China, you can't use Google Image because they won't let you get onto it. But at least here, I can do it. Thank you. Um, so what do I want to do? Why do I have all these people dressed? I want you to think about the way we think as a style of thinking, like you're wearing clothes. And what does that mean? I have a small image here, so I have to look up here. That when you put on the clothes, it makes you feel like a particular kind of person. And I want to say that the way we think about things, the way we organize it, the way we order it, the way we classify things, is a way in which we begin to feel like certain kinds of people. And also, who's not those people? Um, we were talking before about uh, how businesses are to, to organize the way its workers are supposed to sort of work. 
Well, that's a particular way of thinking about what work is like, but also who those people are. Those people are, and also you have to have a notion of the worker, because it, I don't know if you realize the notion of worker is a relatively recent way of thinking about people. Well, if you think of the way we think in styles of clothes, there are different ways you can think, and therefore different kinds of people. And if you look at the different images, and I try to sort of put different images up there, each of those have a different image of the self. But the self is never just a self, it's a historical self. That is, it's a way of thinking of who you are within a historical <coughs> place and space in which that clothes makes sense. All right? Um, and then I'm going to say that schools are like dressing places, only what their dressing places are are to make kinds of people. And you have to think of it in a very simple way. Why do you send kids to school? You want to be different than they would be if they didn't go to school. And so, it, otherwise, why send them? And so schools are places to make kids into certain kinds of people. And if you look at the early, um, well, I know in Swedish history, you can, uh, Kenneth Helkers did a, a work on this, but in the American Revolution, the first thing they talked about is you have to educate people so they can be citizens. Because to have a republic, you, you need people to act in certain ways. They have to participate. And you're not born participating, you have to learn that. And schools are the place, education become the place. So I'm using them synonymously, but they may not be. Um, and if you look at the activities of the learning sciences, mathematics, music, and art, they're all styles of reasoning that are, and I use the word alchemy, and I'll get to it later, but alchemy is a way of transforming one thing into another. And that when kids are in school, when they're taking, and I'm gonna I'll talk about this later, when they're studying music, and they're studying science, and they're studying math, I'm using putting those three together because we have our math and science people here. Um, when you look at it, the topics are the same, but look at the psychology of it. That is how you think of kids. They're the same across, and I, I mean, um, I did something with someone in music education, and we looked at the standards of music education in the US, and then we looked at the standards of math education in the US, and you know what? When you take the math out, they're talking about the same thing, problem solving, motivation. I mean, the words are just the same. And so you have to ask, how does that happen? I mean, why, and why does it happen? What are the sort of, what styles of thought are being produced by using the same denominator when you're talking about what seemingly are very different subjects? Um, and then all of this is my way of thinking about the political, which can be understood both in terms of Foucault's notion of governmentality, but also Rancière, who a uh, political philosopher who talks about the partition of the sensible. Um, and it's a different notion of politics than voting for your, the social democrats or the liberals, or for me, the democrats or the republicans. Or in structural theories, talking about uh, class or race or gender. This enters into it, but not in the way in which the structural categories enter into it. So what I'm going to talk about is a way of reasoning, and I'm going to use <coughs> um, from a number of different things that talk about that. This is another way of thinking about styles. Um, what's interesting to me about this, each of these are talking about what it means to be a healthy person. And if I look on the right, that one fits very well in Sweden, but it fits well in the US. It's someone who eats the right foods, who does exercise, goes running. I know that person very well. Um, and someone who could read the science about it in a way that um, tells you how many calories and so on you're eating and so on. That's a particular kind of person, all right? And that notion of healthy, you have to understand, is historically very specific. Here's another notion, Yang Shen, which is if you go into a park in Beijing, You'll see early in the morning, you'll see people doing this, and this is a, another way of thinking about what it means to be healthy. Very different, and you can see the imagery, I, I think, carries that difference, all right? And so, this is what I mean by making of people. That is, this is a historical way of thinking about who we are, and schools are places that do that for us, all right? And it, I'm not talking about a singular who we are, there are multiple who we are, and part of the problem is understand how that multiple gets produced in schools, especially when you're talking about inclusion and equity and justice. Um, all right, so 
these is in back of what I'm going to talk about, this sort of making up kinds of people. And uh, I'm going to use two examples, or three <coughs> examples. One is this report that we're doing for, actually it's for the Ministry of Education and the Minister, but it's being done for the Science Foundation. And I'm going to talk about a particular part of it, um, which is we're looking at international comparisons. We're looking at PISA, um, the Tim studies, and a whole bunch of other things, and looking at the research that's produced out of that. It's really interesting. That's what this does. Um, <coughs> by the way, these were done mostly by Kenneth and, um, and Sherbert, not me. That's my strength isn't doing that. But if you look at 1960-64, these are the comparisons. Um, this is, um, I don't know whether this is OECD, but look at it today. How, much, how many statistical reports are being <coughs> research reports are being produced that compare nations. Um, and you see a proliferation of that. And that proliferation is not just more people are doing it, it's also a way of thinking about how you tell the truth about what goes on in school and what doesn't go on in school. And so it's really important to understand that we were talking before about acting. <coughs> the teacher's a change agent. And the language they use, it's, a, it's also very interesting. They say they, in the McKinsey reports, but it's not only there, they have highways. Now, usually, it's an interesting metaphor. What is a highway? You get on a highway, you know where you're going. And you may have points to get off and get on, but you know where that's going to end. And so the highway is a very interesting notion of certainty. Um, and what is it? Um, and if you look, and again, I'm using this um, from both. Um, if you look at the teacher practice, they want to tailor the teacher. And the word is used, tailoring the teacher, in terms of dispositions. Okay? Not, a, not that you know how to pick up a glass and drink water, but how you feel and act in doing that. And they talk about habits of mind, the right dispositions. And then the, the OECD and um, McKinsey talk about lifting teacher status, better assessments of teachers, better recruitment procedures, benchmarks to standify and codify what teachers do so you know who's going to be the expert teacher, but also how you get there. All right, so the teacher becomes <coughs> the change agent, and I have to, I like the badge. Um, I once used that in Moscow and I almost got in trouble. <laughs> um, all right, and um, now I want to go on to another sort of element of this. When they talk about um, these things of better performance, lifting teacher status, better assessment, and so on, those aren't empirical facts. They're abstractions of the system about how you begin thinking of a teacher working in a school system. Notice the, and the system is continually used. Um, and so, if you look in, um, this is from, yeah, this is from, um, I don't remember where this is from, the Swedish report or whether it's from, I think it's from, no, it's from um, one of the McKinsey reports. Uh, one of the things they say, you need a way of hiring better teachers. And then they look across all these different places and say they hire better teachers because they have more stringent management rules, because they're really talking about management theory. Um, and so you can see how they're ranking. Um, here's South Korea, and here's the United States, Australia, England, Hong Kong, Netherlands, Germany. Um, and you can see everything is laid out in schemes that are management. Um, and here, again, it's a very logical, rational, a particular kind of logic, in particular rational, about, and this is also taken from one of the reports, about how you organize the system. Um, and in PISA, they, they, they not only measure, but you go back to that scheme, they're not only talking about the practical knowledge that students have in math and science and literacy, although I think that they're not doing social civics. I think PISA's doing civics now. Um, but they also have background questionnaires. And you begin to seeing this, when I talked about it earlier, this idea of making kinds of people. So they're not only talking about what children are expected to know, um, 
here. And you have to understand, this is about the future. What they're saying is they know what the future child has to know to become an adult. Now, if you're a parent and someone said to you, you know what your child has to know when they're going to be an adult, you're going to say, are you kidding? I can't even get through the day. But they don't. Um, and they, they also know what real life situations are. Um, and they also know what full participation in society and oh, Anna left. I was going to say, if you lived in Beijing, you know that the notion of full participation in Beijing is not the same as living in Stockholm, mm -hmm. or living in Malmo, or living in Madison. And so, but they, and we were talking about yesterday um, with Margareta's research, but what they had to do is translate and make equivalence continually into an abstraction, which then they apply to different places as though they're all equivalent. Um, and that's what they're doing. They're making these gigantic um, statistical leaps about what the future will be at, in the present. Um, and they do it when you look at, you just have to go to the web page, you can see how they're taking background information of ethnicity, of gender, of um, family background, of uh, delinquency, a whole range, range of things that become a way of talking about statistically who the good child is who scores high here, and how that good child is part of the nation who scores high, and how they differentiate those nations. And I call it the trilogy, because again, this is at the turn of the 20th century when the early social sciences emerged as it relates to school. But it wasn't only school, it had to do with the issues of poverty and urbanization. They dealt with what I call the trilogy. One was the school with the kid, but the kid was never by the kid by itself. You had the domestic science of how do you get parents to behave certain ways, and how do you reorganize the community so that you have, I mean, some of it had to be done in the sense of sanitation and um, other things that were happening in industrialization. Um, but it also had to do with the moral quality of the child and the family, and those who deviated from what was considered, or at least without necessarily talking about it, expresses what was the sort of the moral quality of the child in, in, in the country, because it, it is very much related to particular cultural spaces. Um, and so, um, and then, again, it's a salvation thing, because this is, again, quote, and this is from the core practices, it's to open up new pathways and social futures for youth. So again, it's the notion that if you just follow these kinds of things, you're going to be able to deal with all the evils of society and correct them. And in this case, and it's also interesting coding, because it says for youth, but they're not talking about all youth. And this is another thing you have to begin to understand. Usually when they're talking, and this is in the, the subphrase, particularly from non-dominant communities, and you can put whatever name you want on it, but they, they're not, they're the people who are signified as different. In different countries, they're different people. Um, and then they say they're comparing student performance, but they're really doing more than performance. And then they're doing it to assess the impact of educational policy decisions. But in fact, it has not only to do with policy decisions, and that's why I started, it's an, they're abstractions made up of ways of thinking about how do you want to think about the desired school system, in that the desired teacher, but in that the desired child and family and so on. And it's built into the way in which these things are at least historically started. And I'm not saying these people are thinking about that, but it, it's embedded in the way in which these ways of thinking about how you assess schools are built and teachers. Okay. And here's another one, which is um, comparing Finland and Singapore um, about lifting teacher status, better assessment, better recruitment, benchmarks, and so on. And um, this is one that comes out of the teacher practice stuff. Again, you see the trilogy of community partnership. They're all related. Some embedded in this is the child. You don't have to see the child to know it's there. And what I'm saying in all this is that you have to understand all these things are interrelated, that every time you say the child is learning, it's not only that you're talking about. 
and also you're talking about it within a particular system which frames the boundaries of what's possible and what's not possible. This is um, from the OECD. One of the major challenges of each and every school system decide what intervention sh it should make in order to improve its performance. And then they tell you all the, that the 575 interviews and 20 sample systems, and then they tell you that they found the truth. We have observed dominant clusters of interventions, known as clusters, so they're talking statistically, but applying those statistics as a way of thinking about what, it, what constitutes national belonging and who belongs to that nation. And then there's a correlation between performance level and degree of tightness of central control. Again, that's built into the model that they're going to find this. All right? There'll be maybe variations in the way in which the statistics get um, organized, but it is a, it's a management system, including the piece of itself, the, the ways in which those measurements are, are produced embody a particular uh, idea that through measurement you can codify and standardize systems and therefore manage it, administrate it. Um, and then they come up, and this is also, the, the thing that's always amazes me that people believe it, but they say we have six interventions um, that we can identify that tell you how you're going to change your school system of a nation. And again, people take this as a way of talking about not only policy, but researchers. We examined, I think it was, the, we started with something like 11,000 research reports in, the, in this project I'm working with Sverker and Daniel. 11,000. So there are 11,000 researchers, or these groups of researchers, that are taking this, these ideas in different ways as a way of saying, how do I do research on school systems to make them better? So it's not just the policy makers, and it's just not McKinsey, and it's just not OECD. It's a lot of people who are working with the stale, same style of clothing, if I go back to my early analogy. Um, it is a social phenomenon. Um, and then you can see, and what's interesting to me about this, particularly with, well, both the core practice stuff and all, at one level, and then the OECD piece of stuff, it gives you the illusion of democracy. What do I mean by that? If you go back to the names of the report, how these schools got to be good, and how other schools are trying <coughs> to be good, the illusion is, and I say it's an illusion because it, it's um, historically not gonna happen. Um, you have this ranking, and what it's saying is if you somehow follow these six intervention schemes, <coughs> you can also become up like Shanghai or you can become like Hong Kong, or <coughs> reverse historical fortunes, Sweden can become like Finland. Um, and so it's an illusion, no matter where you are in the world, this is the GPS, that if you just do the right thing, you can also rise up here and therefore be equal to other schools. So it is a notion of democracy. It's not the one you think of when you talk about political theory, but it is a notion that everybody can Somehow, if they just try hard enough and do the right thing, they're going to get to be up there. And a lot of policy is about that. I mean, in the US as well. How do you get more kids into <coughs> science and mathematics? So that, and how do we get a more productive workforce? So that, and how do we get schools to be more productive? So that when we get these rankings, we don't have to worry about, well, we have to worry that we're on top so that we, how do we stay on top, which is Finland's problem. Um, or how do you get there? And what's also interesting about it um, I'll give you another one because the next one you can begin to see how it establishes a notion of norm and pathology. Um, and what was interesting to me when I looked at the Swedish report, um, you can see it. What they did in the Swedish report, which I, um, when I got it, I was amazed. They took a highlighter, okay, and as we are, folks, and you're you're in the the, the notion of system is built upon equilibrium and deep disequilibrium. I mean, it's, it's a theoretical notion that's built in, okay? And what does it mean? These, um, Hong Kong is close to equilibrium. When you get down here, there's something wrong here, they're falling out of sync. 
there's something wrong with their system that you have to fix. That's disequilibrium. <coughs> and in fact, if you think of it, it's really about pathology. All right? Because it is a medical language that gets inf infused in this. And folks, I want to see, yeah, I'm right next, we're right next to you. We're in the pathological section. Um, in the same time, <coughs> well, look where you are here. And these are the, this, remember, this is the only language that's in the report. There's no text with it. They're just a charts with highlighting your sweet news. <coughs> and so what these reports are doing, back to this notion, it's an abstraction about a desired world, and in that desired world are those that aren't getting in that world, and they, there's something pathological that you have to fix. And if you remember the report, it says, you know, they have the three things, and at the end they give you what you need to do for intervention. So based upon these macro statistics are notions of pathology. Again, they don't use that word. And they don't talk about salvation. But if you historically start thinking about it, that's what they're, at least for me, what they're about. Okay, here's another one, just so you can see. Again, this is from the report. You see how it's, it's highlighted the country. Um, and you can see what, um, how they're mapping. They're creating a map, it's again a GPS system. Only now you can begin to see it as a GPS system about the norma normality, what's normal and what's pathological. And, and the idea is, you move from here up there. Now I have to admit, I like Shanghai, but I'd rather live in Sweden. But according to this, I don't want to live in Sweden, I want to live in Shanghai. And you can think about that in terms of a, a different notion of context than the one they're using. Um, this is from one of the great Kinsey report. It's the living for every child. <coughs> I'm putting that language up there so you can think about it for a minute. Ensuring that every child benefits from high quality instruction is not only important, but in itself evidence from the international assessment. So it's not something you just believe in. Suggests that strong performance for a system as a whole is dependent on being the case. Depend on this, that is, you need an equal system. Now, it's really interesting because I know a fair amount about South Korea, Singapore, and Shanghai. I would not use the word of equal system. Um, <coughs> very affluent societies. Uh, Singapore is a military. Um, Kingdom. Um, anyway, that, those are. The, but this isn't dealing with that. The notion here is just an assessment. And then, if you look at the, um, and this is where the pathological comes in. But it becomes a way in which you begin as a comparative notion of thinking that's embedded in this, that's just taken for granted. When you say dealing with every child. You have to think about, you have a notion of every child. The language of a lot of educational reforms about all children should learn. When you say all children should learn, you have a notion of unity. Everything, you know what the all is. Because all is a very important signifier in that respect. So you say you're deliver, delivering for every child, you have some norm of what every child is from which you also understand what's not that child. And you can see when you look in the documents, they actually do talk about the child who's not every child. Um, I think I have another. I was playing with this. There it is. So you want to help the child to improve, to achieve higher youth unemployment. <coughs> the all children is the hope of motivating every child and also getting children and parents to have certain kinds of interactions and communication. And there's a lot of research now that talks about, well, you've got to read to the child more often. You have to have more communication at home with the child so they develop more uh, language facility. And when they're talking about that, they're really not talking about every child. They're talking about the poor immigrants, they're talking about ethnic groups, they're talking about racial groups. That's the child when they're talking about needs more reading from parents and so on. The other two. And you can actually trace that very easily. And then you look at the language, the language is, and, you, and they're in the reports, both at the level of practice, of teacher practices, and also at the level of OECD, they talk about what children lack. They lack motivation, 
um, and so on. And all that lacking is built upon a norm of what every child is. And so you see a comparative way of thinking in the documents that talks about equality, but built upon ways of comparing, not comparing in the sense of saying children shouldn't achieve, but the very way in which you talk about the child establishes norms about how they're different. And to put it in another language, it, is, it establishes the average of which these children can never be, because they lack. Um, <clears throat> okay. I want to, I think, one more. I'm close to the end, which I'm happy about. <laughs> I want to add one more <coughs> element to this, which is how this notion of system, and I didn't, in the papers that I've done, it, I get more into how this notion of system operates in the language they use without ever talking about this. I mean, they talk about school systems, but they never talk about theoretically how they're talking about systems and notions of equilibrium and disequilibrium, and also notions of normality and, and uh, pathology, because it's not a language, you don't have to use it, it's just a very technical language they're using. But here I just want to talk about, in both PISA and also the core practices, they assume that when you're teaching science and math, and you've heard this before, <laughs> you're teaching science and math, that's what you're teaching. And I want to argue that that's a false assumption. Um, why, if you, again, look at the history of school subjects, look at the history of mathematics, look at the history of um, science, look at the history of uh, music. I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're alchemies. Why alchemy? This is, and this is my simple way of, of sort of drawing. This is a computer scientist in a building about two blocks from where my office is, okay? And somehow, this travels and I use the word travel, um, and it's like an alchemy. The alchemists were medieval, uh, actually, um, they were medieval chemists, tried to turn metals into gold and change this, this sort of, the space of from one thing into another. What happens when computer science, or whether it's physics, or whether it's molecular biology, or whether it's math, it moves from where people sort of work with that, and it moves into the school. It has to be transported. And what transports it? Psychology. And it's not an argument against psychology, it's a historical argument that psychology has been the transportation mechanism of thinking about what you're teaching in science, what you're teaching in math. And that goes back, remember I talked about the standards, if you look at standards of music education, and you look at the standards of, um, I think I looked at math education. Those standards are written in, in languages of psychology. So, so psychology becomes a transportation tool. And then when it gets in school, it's not math anymore, it's the psychology of the child. And when you look historically at these subjects, they haven't been formed to teach children mathematics. They've been, most of them, as far as I can find, have to do with how do you create the good citizen of the country. And that citizen is, in math, it was to learn algebra, because that was considered a way of disciplining the child and getting the child to think in a particular way that fit the model, at least in the US, of um, how the child was supposed to act as a citizen. And music education, one of the things that came into the school had to do with uh, singing. And why singing? Because you had a lot of immigrants who were having tuberculosis, and so if they sang, the girls, by the way, not the boys, if they sang, they breathed heavy, and that would cure tuberculosis. That's why singing got into the school. And then you can get to music appreciation and understand what are you appreciating. Um, and it's particular music, and some music you could appreciate, and other music was supposed to be corrupting to your soul. In the US in the 1920s, if you learned jazz, jazz was corrupting. So you weren't supposed to teach jazz. So these school subjects are not about what the name is there, but that's not what they're about, at least when they're put into the school. Um, and let me just here take from um, a former student of mine, her, it's her dissertation, which will become a book soon, where she looked at the equal sign. And you think of that as, as a pure mathematical thing, two plus two equal four. But when you think about it, when it's put into a textbook for children, it no longer is that. And what she did in her dissertation, and then we'll do in the book, is showed how this notion of equal, on the equal side, you can see here how it's used to talk about equality, of diversity and multiculturalism. 
when you look at it in the school, you realize it's built to political theories about equality and notions of equivalence. And so the, the, the way it gets culturally signified in the curriculum is not just pure math, nor is it pure science, nor is it anything else pure. <coughs> it becomes a particular way of constructing a way of belonging. And then um, when she looked at it, when she looked at different periods of the math reforms in the US in the 1950s, 1970s, 1980s, 90s, and into the um, current ones, when she looked today, this is the characteristic of the child who learns math. Now, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, I don't want to go into it, but how much of this is related to learning math or being a mathematician, and how much of it is related to a cultural disposition about what it means to be a good citizen? Uh, free thinking, um, self-sufficient, what, I mean, I, I don't know where the math building here, but go over to a mathematician and say, um, are you self-sufficient? And they'll say, what are you talking about? But in school, this is a characteristic of the child who's supposed to be good in mathematics. And you realize it's not about mathematics, it's about something else. But what happens in PISA, but also in the core practice, they take the alchemy as what schools are teaching about math and science and use that as the model. But the model they're using is really a model of normalizing particular kinds of children about who they should be. Again, this abstraction about the future that gets inserted into the present as a way of developing a comparative way of thinking because the child who isn't this is the child who's deviant and pathological. And so you have these different layers that come together in these different kinds of um, research, both at the OECD in Paris, but also in terms of classroom teaching and research about classroom teaching. And in some ways, and I'm not saying they're actually all the same, but they're built upon very similar principles about how you reason and why you reason about children and families and communities in particular ways and not other ways. All right. I'm going to summarize back to my title. Why is it impractical? First of all, there are paradoxes. The very models that are used are PISA to tell you how you should intervene in school systems or core practices, how you should make the, the expert teacher, are built upon notions of stability rather than change. They're built upon the very existing categories that exist in the schools. And those become the way in which you think about change. It's really interesting. I was reading some stuff which is also very uh, popular in this literature by Engstrom, who's over across the, the, the sea in uh, Helsinki. And he talks about uh, Hegelian logic in psychology. And he says that children are going to create new objects. But in fact, they're starting with the very, very objects that, um, that are in schools. And so they're not really creating new objects, they're just sort of re-signifying those objects in the psychology. And so you can see how the change um, is not about change, it's about action and motion. Um, and it's also built upon the alchemy because it conserves these very models of curriculum that we use to organize the school. If we go back to my notion of mathematics and what I said about music education. Um, and there, but at the same moment, while I say that they're about stability, they're also about a different notion of change. They're built upon abstractions that have some desired notion about who the teacher is, but also who the society is. And what these models do is try to actualize it. And they collect the data. And the data and the abstractions, and by the way, you can go back to um, Adam Smith and Wealth of Nation, because he did this too. He, he said, let's think about nations as uh, having wealth. And then he went out and collected data to sort of think about how you can collect data to begin to think about what it means to have wealth of a nation. And this is what these people are doing too. It's not about what, it, they're not describing what's there. They're creating descriptions that, that relate back to their abstractions and models, and then telling you that's the way, through interventions, we can achieve those models. Um, there's an irony in that, and the irony is, if it's an abstraction about a desired world, it's sort of a, a utopian theory that's hidden under a notion of empiricism. It's also an irony that it's a comparative <coughs> mode of thought that's supposed to create an equitable and just society, but in fact, in the very notion of comparative, it excludes 
and it excludes through the way in which it normalizes and treats pathologies. So, why did I say it's impractical? Um, it's impractical in terms of a strategy or theory of change. It's impractical as a strategy of research, I think. And it's also impractical if you're thinking about the social commitments you have that relates to education. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. <coughs>